Hi, I'm Simon. Thanks for tuning in to The Ordinary Filmmaker. If you're new here, click subscribe to receive notification of new videos like this one so you don't miss any news, rumors, or tutorials. And by the way, I'm giving away a brand new Canon EOS R5 full-frame mirrorless camera to one lucky viewer. Details are in the description down below, or you can watch this video here. Or am I putting it on this side? I don't know. This is a new scene that I'm trying, a new location. Uh, but essentially, all you have to do is subscribe for your chance to win. There are some restrictions and blackout areas, but if you go ahead and watch that video, the details are down there in the description. So here we are, another week, another q and I don't know, I think I've been doing this for about five weeks now. I'm trying different things. Uh, just give you an idea of what type of equipment I'm using here today. I do have one light on me here right now because it's a little cloudy, and I expect it to stay cloudy for the entire shoot. I'm using the Canon EOS R5, and I'm shooting 4K HQ. So that's the 8K downsampled mode, downsampled in the camera to 4K. And I'm also shooting in C-Log. And to help blur the background a little bit, I'm shooting with a Kinko ND vari or a variable ND filter, and it's not quite at the max, but it's pretty close. I wonder if that's gonna hurt me. We'll have to see. Depends on what happens with the sun. I think I'm just hidden, so when the sun does come out, it's gonna push this way, it's not gonna hit me, but the background will light up nicely. But enough rambling. Let's get into the questions. Our first question is from FOMO. FOMO asks, for YouTube videos, what's the most efficient 4K recording format with good enough image quality? Efficiency defined as the speediest workflow. You may choose whatever camera necessary to maximize productivity. FOMO, that's a terrific question. You're looking for an efficient workflow. Um, so you want to reduce the amount of time you want to, from the time you shoot to the time you publish, you want to try and constrict that a little bit, but at the same point, still having a decent quality. My recommendation is to get something like the Ninja 5 external recorder because what that's going to do is it's going to record your video and it's going to save it to the SSD and it's going to give you Apple ProRes 4.2.2, it can give you Apple ProRes RAW and there's a few other formats as well. And the advantage of that is there's no transferring media from storage to your computer. What you can do is once you're finished shooting, take that SSD, plug it into your computer and then here's the really great part. You can edit right off of the SSD because it's already converted to Apple ProRes 4.2.2. So if you're using Final Cut Pro or DaVinci, you're gonna able, able, be able to start editing right away. There's no converting to ProRes. There's no converting to another file format. There's no need to even worry about proxies. If you've got a decent computer with a decent GPU, you're not gonna need to set up any of that stuff and you're ready to go. So then the question is, well, what video format? I would use 4K 30. Now, if you're using Canon, I would go with 4K 30 HQ. Uh, I wouldn't worry about C-Log, especially if you're shooting inside. If you're shooting outside like me, C-Log will give you a benefit, but it's gonna add that much extra time. And really, if you're putting it up to YouTube, are you really gonna see that much of a difference? Most of our clients, most of our customers are viewing using smartphones. So I would think 4K 30 is more than enough, or if you're a 30, uh, 24 frames per shooter kind of guy, than 24 or 25 if you're in PAL regions. But I think that's really the best way to go. It eliminates the whole transfer uh, situation uh, for studio work, and I think for YouTube, that's one of the best ways. Now, for you guys who are watching that aren't FOMO, that isn't for YouTube, if you're doing run and gun stuff or fun and gun stuff, then the Ninja isn't probably the best option for you. Um, then you're looking at different types of CF Express cards or other storage devices, but that's a whole nother question. And I don't want to give too much away because I'm actually going to be answering that very shortly. So really good question, FOMO. Sawab asks, I understand due to overheating concerns, the R5 might not be the best camera for a YouTuber in India, but for making YouTube videos, would you recommend this camera? I believe you can gain a lot of value by shooting in 8K and then cropping down. Generally, we can plan our music video scenes more as compared to run and gun style of shooting. So overheating might not be as bad as an issue for music videos. What are your thoughts? In your heat, in India, 8K is going to be a big problem. I, I don't think it's going to work for you. My honest suggestion is you, for what you're doing with music videos or any other kind of film work, I would be looking at something in the same budget, the, the C70, for example. That'll be coming out shortly, and it's going to allow you to sync up things, uh, other, other equipment, other cameras. Uh, for music videos, the C70 is going to be a really, really good camera for you. Uh, I think that's probably the best way to go. Um, the A7S III, if you want to stick with a video hybrid camera, is pretty good. 
but I, you know, I'm, I'm liking the C70. It's got built-in ND filters, so whether you're inside or outside, you can adjust to the lighting, and I, I think that's a really good way to go. I'd really look into that. I think trying to get these um, stills hybrid cameras or video hybrid cameras to work for you in this situation might not work that well. Canon asks, would you consider making a vlog-like video? Yes, I would, and actually, yes, I have. I've made a few of them. I don't do a lot of them because, well, it takes time. I usually do it when I'm doing um, some sort of product reviews and I need to get out and about. I really do enjoy it, it's a lot of fun, but on the weekdays it's really tough to do. I have a very, very busy life. Believe it or not, this is not my day job. I actually have a full-time job and then as soon as work is over, I quickly try to figure out what there is to do in terms of news. Is there any news on the market? Do I need to create a video today? And most of the time there is. So I've got between four and five, or between four and six o'clock to script out the video to get things ready. Then at seven o'clock, I usually shoot it and have it finished and edited by about eight o'clock. And then I might spend a little bit of time doing some comments. And of course, while I'm doing that, I'm doing my workout, I'm spending time with my family. So it makes it for a very, very busy day. So I usually save the vlog type stuff for the weekends. Sajan asks, I'm curious to know if the upcoming firmware update to the Canon R5 will do something to mitigate the overheating issue or add 120 frames per second to 1080 or even lower bitrate modes for videos. Well, there's three things there. So let's talk about the first one, overheating. I wouldn't be surprised if they make more changes to the algorithm, but I wouldn't be expecting miracles. I wouldn't, be ex I wouldn't expect to, for example, be able to shoot unlimited 8K in hot climates or anything like that. Um, I d wouldn't expect to be able to shoot an hour worth of 4K HQ in hot climates either. Now, keep in mind, though, the R5 will allow you to shoot unlimited 4K 30. And depending on your 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 audience who you're making it for 4k 30 does provide a significant level of detail and if your output is 1080 you're going to downsample that in post it's going to look really really good so sadly i don't think we're going to see a huge improvement in terms of overheating now in terms of 120 frames per second in 1080 canon has said that is coming but they haven't said when i'd expect it could come in the next couple of firmware updates and in terms of uh, video editing mode, um, lower bit rates. Well, Canon has mentioned again that they're going to be providing cinema raw light and some other low bit rate modes. But again, until we see it, you know, it's just vaporware, right? Promises, promises. You can wish in one hand and you can, well, I'm not going to get into that expression. It's not very polite, but which hand's going to fill up quicker? Definitely not the one you wish into. So really good question. And guys, it's starting to wind up a little bit here. As you've noticed, I've already changed the... Um, the covering on my mic to hopefully lessen the wind. It's a problem with shooting outside. You don't have control over the environment. It was more sunny, it was a little warmer, and there was no wind, but now the wind is picking up and the temperature is a whopping 52 degrees or 11 centigrade. But let's get on to the next question. Snehal Kumar asks, is there any update regarding Sigma RF mount lenses? Sadly, no, I haven't heard anything else. I just have to wait and see. As soon as I do have news, I'm going to go ahead and publish that in a video, so make sure you subscribe so you get the latest information. Clive, one of my regulars, asks, What price do you expect the Canon M50 Mark II to come in at? And what do you think about the Canon M7? Well, in terms of price, I think it's going to come in, if we, we look at the initial retail price for the M5 Mark I, around $775 at about 2% per year, and I could see them pricing it as high as $826, but... This year, everything's getting more expensive, so it's really, really hard to say. Now, in terms of the M7, let's refresh and take a look at some of the specs that I talked about in a previous video, courtesy of Canon Rumors. As far as getting a 32 megapixel APS-C sensor, yeah, that's realistic. We got it in the M6 Mark II and the 90D. Dual pixel autofocus too, sure, makes sense. And IBIS, I think that makes a lot of sense. I'd be surprised if they didn't bring that back. An EVF, of course, you're gonna have an EVF, but this one's gonna be attached. Dual SD cards make sense, 12, frames per second serial shooting mode with active autofocus and we're going to get 4k 60 that's pretty good to get 60 frames per second but how soft is it what's the detail like that's something that really matters in 1080 we're supposed to be getting 120 frames per second but it will have overheating in 120 frames per second and i'm a little curious about this so wait a minute you're going to give us 120 frames per second in 1080 and it'll have overheating, but 4K 60 won't, over have, heat, won't have overheating? I'm not so sure about that. The, the only real problem I have with this, it looks pretty good, it looks like a solid camera, 
But when I see the rumored price, you know, $1,600, I have a problem with that. Uh, oh, one other thing it's supposed to get is C-Log, which is a nice addition that helps put the price up a little bit. Uh, for these specs, and again, it really depends. I don't know what the outcomes are going to be like. I don't know what quality video it's going to produce or the stills or what other capabilities the camera has. And that matters a lot in terms of still shooting as well. I mean, $1,600 could be a good price, but keep in mind, that's full frame territory. You can get the EOS RP right now for about, what is it, $999, and last Christmas it was on sale for $899. You can also get the Canon EOS R for that price. So I, it sounds nice, um, but I'm not buying this one. I need more information. I need some validation before I start getting excited about this one. Dan asks, what's the difference between RAW and log footage? Very good question. Uh, to a lot of people, it seems like the same thing. They both give us high quality video, right? Well, no. I mean, yes, you can get high quality video out of them, but you want to think of them differently. So what RAW is, is simply just the data. It, it's not a video format in any way whatsoever. It's just taking the information from the sensor and dumping it into a file. No media player, no software is going to be able to do anything with that unless it knows how to work with RAW files. So any consumer devices will not be able to play it. Whereas log, log is a video file format. And the whole log format, whether it's C-log on Canon or S-log on Sony, V-log, whatever you call it, what these log profiles do is they give us more dynamic range. So what happens when you shoot the video, it seems like it's a little bit watered down, the saturation's gone, it's not a very pleasing look. But then we take it into post, and then we apply a lot to it, which makes it come back up to the way we want it to, where we can balance it, and then choose a different LUT if we want to give it a different look. But log, the nice thing about log, and for photographers out there, you, you, you get this, you don't have to worry about having the metering wrong or the ISO information wrong because you can fix that in post. And for a video that I'm shooting right now, like this, and the light is not on me, let's try that. If the sun changes dramatically from where it is and all of a sudden the clouds disappear and I've got sunlight, it could blow me away. It could underexpose me or overexpose me and create all sorts of problems for me, causing me to have to reshoot. Whereas if I shot in RAW, that would be powerful. But I'm not about to shoot these videos in 8K RAW and edit them later. 4K RAW, I would, but 8K? You're looking at 18 gigabytes a minute. I shot 30 minutes yesterday and it came to 586 gigabytes. That's staggering. Welcome back, Thirandu. Uh, Thirandu asks, latest rumors suggest that the Canon M50 Mark II won't have IBIS. It will have 4K 60 frames per second uncropped. If it had IBIS, it would undoubtedly be the best APS-C mirrorless camera on the market. What's your thoughts? Yeah, you know what? I, I really wish they would squeeze it in there. I think IBIS, again, um, I've shot for, what, seven odd years without IBIS in a video camera, and I can tell you, once you go IBIS, you can't go back. It's just amazing how much better your video footage is, how stable it is. I was shooting my son riding his bike through the forest uh, a couple of months ago, and it was just amazing how good the video footage was. Whereas when I did this with my 70D, it was like <laughs> jumping all over the place. It was just absolutely crazy. You know, I, <laughs> whereas with the, the R5 with IBIS, you know, yeah, I'm kind of holding on for dear life while trying to film with a camera out here and it produces really, really good results. So I think IBIS is a terrific technology. You can work around it. I've shot uh, videos with um, the tripod attached to help stabilize, because adding more weight to the camera helps you stabilize it a bit more. You don't get those fast, jittery motions. Other things you can do, I, I, I don't like gimbals and glide cams as much because they add an awful lot more weight to it and you've got batteries involved, except for glide cams. I do have one and it does produce very good results, but in terms of quality, it wasn't that much better than me holding a tripod out. So, and, and other things you can do too, basically, basic filmmaking 101 is if you've got a fence or something close by, kind of brace yourself up against it, brace the camera against yourself to help, but we'll have to wait and see. I would really love to see IBIS in this, but keep in mind, we've got two other rumored cameras coming out, the M7, which is supposed to have it, and of course the M5 Mark II, which previous rumors said we were getting IBIS. But remember, Thirandu, these are just rumors. Until we actually get the final specs or we get something that's validated, 
At this point, we don't really know if it has IBIS or not. We'll just have to wait and see. Soroba asks, how many types of camera sensors are available in the market? And why CMOS sensor is so popular in all brands? I'm not going to get into different sensor sizes like Micro Four Thirds, uh, Full Frame, APS-C. I'm going to get into the type of sensor. So you mentioned CMOS. The other type is CCD. And CCD is generally going to give you um, better low light performance. And you're going to see these in broadcast cameras. They're more expensive. And the reason why we see the CMOS sensors in all our cameras, because they're less expensive. Now, yes, they do have, they don't collect as much light, but there are several ways or technologies that camera companies have implemented to reduce that, uh, reduce the impact of that. So some of them will do some lensing in front to bring more light into the, uh, the pixels. Others you will use backlighting and you know, the cameras produce a pretty good result. But when it comes to sensors, the sensor has different filters as well. There's the bare filter, there's what is, and it has, uh, for a photo site, it has red, green, green, blue. So it's got four pixels, two of them sense, uh, sense green. Uh, then you've got other cameras that will do an RGBW. So you've got one for red, one for green, one for blue, and the other one just brings in all light. So it's for better low light performance. Then you've got completely different sensors in some cameras, um, and these are different industrial uses, commercial uses, well, you actually have three sensors in one camera and they're kind of arranged like this. And so one sensor only picks up red light, one blue and one green. And as you can imagine, the low light sensitivity and the crispness of the color, the color registers is just phenomenal with these cameras. They are quite boxy. And again, they're for industrial purposes. Uh, one of the reasons why CMOS sensor was settled on um, back in the day, Canon had made some breakthrough, breakthroughs with it and it produced really great results. So by the time we got to the Canon uh, 70D, the, uh, the 5D Mark II, the results were very good that pretty well everybody stuck to it and stuck with the bare filter, the RGB filter as well, because well, it works. Why develop something new? Gridaside asks, will R5 files always be a pain to edit? I heard the main issue is something to do with 422 and H.265. Are there ways to get around this, or will technology catch up and be able to work with the file type anytime soon? Your thoughts? I don't find it a pain to work with these files, but last year, when I knew I was going to get into 4K, I knew I needed a more beefed up computer, I needed a better processor, and I needed a better GPU. And no matter how you slice it, if you're getting into 4K, you're going to need a faster computer. But that being said, there are ways of working with 4K. If I'm shooting 4K 30, I don't have any drop fr frames and it works pretty good. But the real best way to edit video, if you want to have it very smooth and whether you're working in 4K or 8K, um, and I have the iMac Pro, by the way, I find that the best thing to do is to convert all your video files to Apple ProRes 422. Now, if you're looking at a 10 minute 4K video, it doesn't really take that long. It can take about 10 minutes or so and you can be doing other work while the computer's doing that. But if you're shooting a lot of video and you want it to, have but to be buttery smooth during the editing process, then your best thing to do is to shoot with an external recorder that outputs in something like Apple ProRes 422. So then you can take that SSD, attach it to your computer, and you're gonna have absolutely no stuttering at all in 4K 30, uh, 6K will probably be good. And when I get the Ninja myself, I'll test out 8K. But one thing I've noticed, and I use Final Cut, is that when I bring in 8K uncompressed, or sorry, um, unconverted to ProRes, and I render it, I can play back no problem, and, it, and the playhead just moves. I don't drop any frames. And that's one of the problems, too, is if you don't convert to Apple ProRes 422, once you start editing, then you've got those, those slow, the, the slowness. But the other thing you can do is you can use proxy files to edit, and that's going to make the editing process a whole lot better. But it isn't going to speed up your export process. So if you've got a slow computer and you edit using proxies, when you go to edit, or sorry, uh, export, you could be looking at anywhere from an hour to hours to export. And this video here, which I shoot in C-Log, I, I don't convert it to uh, Apple ProRes 422, although I'm gonna do it this time because I wanna test to see what it's like in terms of uh, export times. But what it normally takes for a one hour video to export is two hours and 30 minutes. Now for a video like this, I don't really care because I generally shoot it Saturday morning. I'll do some editing and then I'll walk away and leave it. And so while I'm walking away, I could just have it go ahead and export 
And if it takes two, two and a half hours, so what? I'm doing other things, it doesn't really matter. But if you're trying to get content out the door right away, and if you're doing YouTube type stuff or studio stuff or event stuff where you're not moving around with a camera, I think that the Ninja 5 is an excellent option and will really, really help you. But again, if you've got a slow computer, you've got to address the GPU and the processor. You've got to, you've got to, you've got to up upgrade your computer. And also don't cheap out on, on the RAM too. Cheap RAM um, can quite often be the cause of your computer crashing. So you always want to get good RAM as well. Rocky asks, where do I get this Canon official R5 lot from? I've looked everywhere for it and can't find it. Yeah, Rocky, I, I don't know what's going on with Canon. Um, when I did a video a couple of days ago or a couple of weeks ago, I told people where to get it. I showed some videos showing where you can find it. And I checked this morning. You can find the lot files for the R5 on the Canon Canada site uh, for the download section. So you go to the Canon R5 support, downloads, and you should be able to find it's the file called lookup table. But as you can see here, I'm doing an overlay. So this should really be able to help you out. I don't know why it's gone from the Canon USA site, but you can at least get it from the Canon Canada site right now. And if somehow it's gone by the end of this video, let me know and I'll find a way to get you a copy. Eminem asks, hi there. How do we connect to a live stream? What device do we use? Is there software or a laptop or what? You can actually make live streaming very simple. Now there's, first of all, let's tackle software because you're definitely going to need to obtain some software to make this happen. You can go with the open, open source OBS, which is full featured, incredible, it's open source, but it is a little tricky to figure out. Or you can go with something like Ecamm. And the great thing about Ecamm, they give you 14 day free trial so you can try it out and see how it e easy it is to use. So maybe start off, download the free trial of Ecamm, put it on your computer. Now it only works for Mac, so if you don't have a Mac, then I'd stick with OBS. So now you've got your computer. You can actually use the webcam and start off trying webcam and use the speaker from the computer. Now, obviously, the video isn't going to be the greatest. Neither is going to be your audio. And this is where we take the complexity and we multiply it by 100. What kind of microphone do you want to connect up? Now you need some sort of audio mixer. And what about a video switching device? You have multiple cameras. Well, now you need to hook up your camera. You need a cable from the HDMI to the video mixer. You need to understand the video mixer. I'll put the video mixer into a computer and you can see that complexity really jumps up. So what I would do is start off simple and when you want to start off streaming, stream to YouTube, but do it in private or unlisted so nobody can see it. Practice doing it that way before you're actually ready to go live. Because I can tell you, I've done about eight of these and the first six was just testing it out and it, I was making mistakes a lot because I found OBS a little difficult to work with but I found Ecamm a whole lot easier, but still I forgot to check the streaming output and I was outputting in 720 instead of 1080. There are a lot of videos that will tell you how to use OBS, how to set up your first streaming, and a lot of these are 20 minutes or longer, and you're gonna need to watch a few of those. It'll really help you get comfortable with it, but uh, nothing beats actually just playing around with it. And don't forget, you wanna do some test screens to YouTube, for example, and make sure you're in private mode. Urgajan Deep asks, which is better for both photo and video, the 90D or the EOS R? I mainly focus on photos. It's a really good question. I actually did a video almost a year ago. It's one of my first few videos. And I do recommend you watch it, or it's over here. I'm not sure which side I'm putting it on. Um, it's a terrific video. Uh, my, my presentation skills aren't the best. Uh, the audio isn't the best, but uh, the information is bang on. So I'll say this. If you're photocentric, you're going to do more, more photos, then your, the EOS R is going to be better for you. The EOS R is actually a mirrorless version of the 5D Mark IV without really any enhancements. Yes, I, I know what you're thinking. There are some minor tweaks here and there, but nothing enough to say, wow, it's the successor to the 5D Mark IV. But if it comes to video, the 90D is a far better camera. And why do I say that? You can produce better results. You've got better dynamic range with the EOS R, but the Canon 90D gives you 120 frames per second in 1080, and the EOS R doesn't. And it tops out in 4K at 24 frames per second, so if you like shooting 30 frames per second like I do, that's a bit of a problem. And the 4K on the 90D is very good, and especially if you're doing 1080, I think your best result is to shoot in 4K and then downsample into... Uh, 1080 but um, yeah watch that video I go into all the details kind of saying why that the 90D is a better all-around video camera and if you're more into photos than the EOS R 
And if you're looking for a camera that's considerably better than the R5, sadly, I think you almost, on the Canon side, I think you pretty well have to go up to the R5 where you get, now you get 120 frames per second in 4K, you get 8K, you get 8K down slamping in a 4K, you get really good quality, really good detail. Um, it, it's just phenomenal, the results. But um, it, it's, if you get the EOS R, it's not like it's going to produce really bad video. But there is one thing that's not very good about the EOS R. The rolling shutter will make you seasick. Now, the EOS R5 rolling shutter in 8K and 4K is so much improved because it has that much faster Digic X processor. But the EOS R, it's, the rolling shutter is pretty bad. Yeah, very, very bad. Frosty asks, have you tried shooting with the R5 in Animal Eye Detect with puppies and kittens? I'd like to see how well that works for getting great shots and video. No, I haven't, and I've been dying to try this out, Frosty. The biggest problem is we have this social distancing, so people are kind of keeping to themselves and, you know, asking you to take shots of your puppy. Don't always go well, but I'm going to do my very best to get you some shots, some video of puppies, and if you're watching this video with puppies, then you'll know I was successful and able to get some. But, yeah, it's a really good idea. The nice thing about the R5, if you guys aren't aware of this, in the autofocus mode, you can actually set it so it's got people priority, animal priority, or in between. And I have shot ducks, I've shot birds, and I've even shot squirrels, and the eye autofocus is bang on. Um, while Canon says it only does birds, it does do a pretty good job of other animals as well. Bogdan asks, the SanDisk Extreme Pro SDXC UHS-2 U3 128GB card, which I'm getting two of them, I think this card's enough for 4K at 60 frames per second, and the minimum bit rate in all I. What do you think? Would you choose something else? Well, I'm going to approach this from two different views. Uh, the view of best practices as the industry looks at it, and of course from what Canon views. Now, I actually thought you were getting the R6, and right now the R6 doesn't do all I, but I'm still going to answer the question from the point of view of all I and IPB. You basically want to use this to get an idea of what cards you're going to need to have to support your camera. So here we can see that for 4K video, sdcard.org recommends anywhere from a V60 UHS-2 card all the way down to a V10. So depending on what you're shooting in, that could be a problem. But since you're looking at getting a Canon camera, let's go ahead and take a look at what Canon says in terms of output. This chart is taken from the Canon R5 manual. Your manual might be a little different. If you're going to be getting the R6, you obviously won't get 8K, and you're not going to have all I, at least not with the current firmware. But this is very telling. Let's go ahead and take a look at 4K, UHD, the basic frame rates of 24, 25, and 29. If you're shooting IPB, 120 megabits per second is perfectly fine. You're going to be able to shoot no problem um, with the card you're looking at, the V30 card. But if you shoot all I in any of those basic frame rates, the bit rate is 470 megabits per second, which is about 58 to 59 megabytes a second. So you're going to need at least a V60 card to be able to handle that bit rate. So the one you're looking at won't be able to handle all I in the basic frame rates, let alone 4K 60. But let's go ahead and take a look at 4K UHD at 60 frames per second. And the same applies for 50 frames per second if you're in PAL. IPB is 230 megabits per second, which divided by 8 gives you 28.75 megabits. So a V30 card will just barely work. However, look at all I. All I is 940 megabits per second. That's 117.5 megabytes per second. Your V30 card isn't going to be capable enough. And this is the thing. So while I can say that, you know, this card will work for you in some scenarios, the ones you're asking for all I and at 60 frames per second, it's not, a, it's not even going to come close to cutting it. And this is why I really like CF Express cards. Even the slowest CF Express card can easily handle 8K. Uh, anything you can throw at it, so it allows you to grow. If you go to a different camera, you can take these cards and they'll work. UHS-2 is pretty good too, but if you're going to be going to the expense of UHS-2, I would just get the V90 cards. You're going to be able to do 60 frames per second, 120 frames per second. It's going to work in all I. Now, I have shot, I have a lot of V30 cards, and I've shot 4K30 HQ to a V30 card. And it's worked perfectly fine. It takes a long time to copy it off the, 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 the camera. I was going to say the computer. It takes a long time to copy it off, but it will work. Sadly, 
to shoot in these frame rates, it's going to cost you. Now, I do want to say one thing, though. IPB isn't a bad format. I prefer all I. I've ranted about how I think all I is important. But as any professional would tell you, professionals don't always shoot all I. They don't always shoot manual. They don't always shoot with a certain way of doing things. What a professional does is know when to shoot, choose different settings. And if you're doing studio work, for example, a talking head work, IPB is going to be more than acceptable. It's going to work. But if you're doing fun and gun stuff, I would want to shoot in all eye. So hopefully that answers your question. Um, probably doesn't give you the answers you're looking for or that you would hope for. Another question from Bogdan. I have like $700 for other things like filters, backpack, and tripod. What else do I need to buy? Well, I mean the basics. You're going to get a battery with your camera, but it's always good to have a backup battery, an another battery. It's, uh, you're, if you don't, you're going to curse the times you don't. So you've got that, you've got a tripod, uh, you've got a lens obviously, so you're going to have, you want a general purpose lens, definitely. But something else that I think is very, very important, and Bogdan, I never used one up until recently, but a variable ND filter. Uh, what that's going to allow you to do is when you're shooting out in bright sun, you're not going to have situations where the entire frame is almost white because you've got too much sunlight. Uh, and in situations where I'm shooting like now, if I turn the ND filter up quite a bit, it allows me to blur the background a lot more so you can separate the subject from the background. And without an, and without an ND filter, you wouldn't be able to do that. There are many different ways of applying the ND filter. You can put it on the end of the lens, and that means it only works for one lens. Or you can put the ND filter between the camera and the lens. And of course, cinema cameras, they come with an ND filter built right in. But yeah, an ND filter. Um, obviously a camera bag, you're going to want something. Don't get one of those really huge ones. You want something that's going to fit in a plane, something small. And I produced a video not too long ago saying what would be in my Canon R5 camera bag, so that's important. Also some microfiber cloths for cleaning it, um, a blower, they're pretty cheap, and a, a, a pen. Um, one end of it, it has like a little microfiber cloth on it where you can rub it around the lens if you get grease on it. And the other end is a little brush where you can brush dirt and debris off the camera. Uh, I think those are really useful too. Um, outside of that, all the other suggestions I have, suggestions I have for you are going to cost considerably more. But I, I think you want to keep it light. Oh, um, also a white balance card. And there's many ways of doing this. Uh, you can actually get a card that works. Uh, or you, what you can do is you can wear a watch and you can maybe get a, a, a band. This is too dark, but you can get a gray, um, a gray band, uh, the type of band that's perfect for white balancing because surprisingly or not, white isn't the best. Because when I'm out shooting, for example, and I've got sidewalks and pavement, I often white balance against the pavement. It, it's almost got that perfect color. And my son likes, loves wearing gray pants right now. So I white balance off his legs and I get really, really good results. But, you know, getting some sort of white balance device that's on you, uh, you can put something on your wrist, that way it's always with you, such as a watch and you've got a sort of a, the, the perfect gray band. Um, who is it? Um, Gerald Undone, he actually uses some sort of, I think they're just laces he puts on his wrist and it's great. You know, you, you just don't forget. I think it's a great way. I mean, I don't want to use laces on my hands. With my office, they'll be like, What's wrong with him? He's got laces on his wrist. And no one's going to ask. They'll just think you're a little bit on the crazy side of weird. Our last question is from Mike. What are the pros and cons of using non-Canon batteries in the EOS R5? Mike, this is a really good question to ask. I find that not a lot of people are really truthful with this answer. I've gone ahead and spent my own money and I purchased two additional Canon LP E6N batteries. And the primary reason I did for that is to maximize the amount of record time. I'm shooting these long videos. I want to get the most amount of battery life that I can, so I spent the extra money for that. Another thing I'll say about Canon batteries, they last, they really do. The battery that I bought with my Canon 70D seven odd years ago, almost eight years ago now, I still use it. Now, I only get about 30 minutes out of it, but I can't say that for other cheap third-party knockoffs that I've gotten. So you, you just, they will last you an awful long time. What are the cons? The price, they're very expensive. Um, they really are, I think they are more expensive than they should be. So, what about using non-Canon batteries? 
Well, that's what you've got to look at. You've got to look at the capabilities you want out of batteries. If you want to maximize the record time, then stick with the OEM batteries. What you're going to notice, and I've, I've, I use Power Edge batteries. They're really cheap. You can get two of them for around $20 on Amazon. And I've had them for a couple of years, and I still get a good 40 minutes to 60 minutes of record time with them. They do a really good job. But they don't have the same amperage. They don't last nearly as long as a Canon battery. But I can get five of them for the price of one Canon battery. So there's that. What I would avoid doing, I'd avoid going with super cheap batteries. The last thing you want is a battery going on you in the camera, leaking and destroying the camera. I've never had this happen to me. I'm 50 years of age. I've been using batteries for decades. I've heard this old argument that's saying you should always stick with OEM, that the, the knockoff batteries are terrible, and they'll destroy your equipment. They won't. There are a lot of really good third-party batteries out there that will last. You just got to do your homework. Don't go for the cheapest ones. Generally go for the more expensive ones. Like I said, I've had a lot of good experience with the Power Edge. Duracell also makes knockoff batteries as well that work very well, but they don't last as long as the OEMs. So that's a really, really good question. Um, I really appreciate that question and everybody for submitting your questions to this Q&A session. I'm actually getting pretty cold here. It's, uh, what temperature is it now? I think it's actually warmed up. It's 54 degrees or 12 centigrade. I'm wearing uh, long underwear, thermal underwear to keep me warm so I don't have to wear a jacket. But the sun has gone away, the clouds are getting thicker. And if I look at, <clears throat> if I look at the camera connect, this is the Canon utility, the camera connect, I can see that I'm still exposed pretty good. Now it looks a little faded, but that's because I'm using C-Log. And I'm exposed properly, I'm metered properly. This has worked out really well, but I'm super cold. Like my fingers are, are not moving properly. And do they look a little purple? Cause they do to me. Are my lips turning a little bit purple? I was not expecting it to be this cold. I sit here for an hour. So I try to dress myself in a way that's gonna be appropriate for the full time. I think the next time I shoot this, I'm gonna to have to start wearing my winter clothes or at least a jacket of some sort. Cause it's getting really cold here. Um, but yeah, it's coming up to the middle of October. It's uh, Thanksgiving weekend here in Canada. So if you're one of the 5% that's from Canada watching, have yourself a happy and safe Thanksgiving. Let me know in the comment section down below. Are you going to go with the traditional turkey? Are you going to do with something like a duck, a ham? What do you have planned for your Thanksgiving weekend? Uh, we're, we're not sure yet. I think we're going to do a small turkey. There's just three of us. Um, we're probably going to do a pumpkin pie. Um, I have a lot of fun memories going back many, many years ago with my family. My dad loved pumpkin pie and we always had a pumpkin pie for Thanksgiving. Um, I just love the taste of them. They're not the most appealing looking pies, but they really, really taste well. And it, and it helps trigger those memories of when I was younger. When I first didn't like it, my dad said, great, perfect. He doesn't like it. Oh, I better turn this light off. It's starting to rain. All right. I'm getting rain. There was not supposed to be any rain here. So I'm going to finish up this video. Um, rain be gone. I'm not, I don't care. Uh, let's close off the computer. I'll put the uh, recording device here and <laughs> I might have to go into vlogging mode. This is absolutely insane. It's starting to rain now. See what I mean about weather? You never know what you're going to get. But essentially, um, I didn't like it right away, but then I started to enjoy it. And my father was like, great, now he likes it too. And with his appetite, it's going to disappear. And my son's only six, but he already loves pumpkin pie. So he's requested that. And we'll probably do the same thing for Christmas. And one thing I like to do, because I lived in the United States many years ago, is I usually like to take US Thanksgiving off too. Why can't I have two Thanksgivings? So if you're not from Canada, consider doing a Thanksgiving this weekend just because, well, you deserve it. All right, so I'm going to move now because it's really starting to come down. I don't want to ruin any equipment. And you can't see me right now, but I'm going to grab the camera and bring it up here as well. Sorry about that. The last thing I want to do is ruin some of my lighting because they're not waterproof at all, nor are the computers or the tablets. So I'm safe now. Uh, on the deck that I have, I have a like a fabric awning that comes out here and it'll keep the camera dry and the lighting dry and me mostly dry unless the weather's coming in sideways. So this is going to be where I plan on shooting a lot of my winter videos if it's snowing. But, you know, if, if you're living in the northern climates and it's fall and you don't like the weather, wait five minutes, it's likely to get worse. As you can see with this video, 
I started off shooting, it was sunny, mostly sunny, then it became partly sunny, then cloudy, then completely cloudy, then dark clouds, and we got some rain, and now it's actually stopped. <laughs> so I probably could have stayed down there. I only needed about another five minutes to close out the video. Uh, but that's one of the joys of doing fun and gun stuff work or shooting outside. You, you, you don't have control over the environment. You don't have control over the weather. It can change dramatically. You need to plan your metering, your camera settings, so that way the camera can adjust the ISO if things change dramatically. And you also want to consider having a secondary ring light or some other light on you so if the sun fades away, you're not completely dark. And I found that really helps. I take the ring light that I've got in the basement, I bring it up here, and it's actually on me now, so it's softening this side of my face a little bit because right here I'm getting the bright light coming off the clouds. It's not the sun. The sun's actually way over here. So there's that. Um, and, of course, neighbors, right? When I first came out here to start recording, it was quite loud. I had the neighbors, and so I had to wait till they quietened down a bit. But you can have sirens going off. You can have cars going off and all that stuff. So that's a lot of fun. But um, get ready because you're going to see some changes over the next coming weeks. You're going to see me shooting in snow. And I'm actually going to be shooting at night because I'm going to start to run out of daylight here. It's going to get dark around 5 o'clock and 6 o'clock. And I'm going to try shooting at night. So maybe I'll do that next week. And I might do something a little special for Halloween coming up. But that's it for now, guys. Thank you so much for watching, for engaging, for commenting. I really do appreciate all of you and your support for this channel. This is not just a gig for me. This is not just a way to make money and get camera gear. It's also a way to make friends and socialize. You saw the pair gear review that I did with the village mayor. We met. We took precautions and made sure we kept safe. But we shot a review together, and I really love that. I love this engagement part of the channel. And so I really, really enjoy that. But uh, don't forget, I am giving away some camera gear. Once the channel reaches 20,000 subscribers, I'm going to be giving away two Cinco Lab microphones to one person. Well, one Cinco Lab microphone and a shotgun mic, the S6E Lab and the M3 shotgun mic. And then for every 10,000 subscribers after that, the price is going to get better and better until we get to 100,000 subscribers. And I'm going to be giving away a brand new Canon EOS R5 full frame mirrorless camera. And I look forward to doing that. Uh, this is a lot of fun for me to do. And I did actually hide something in the frame of this video. So whoever can identify exactly what it is, it is a product. If you can identify exactly what it is, then you'll earn an extra entry into this video. And it's the first person to identify it. But that's it for now, guys. Thank you so much for watching The Ordinary Filmmaker. We'll see you again soon.